Hello, hello. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Baha'i Chat. We're so excited to have this time together to address one of America's most vital and challenging issue, race in America. We, this is a time for us to come together and share an uplifting moment where we can address some of society's ills through a spiritual lens. And we're just honored that you'd be willing to join us today to have this conversation. We look at this through the lens of the Baha'i faith and the writings of the Baha'i faith and how people are putting this into action in their daily lives. Excellent. Yes. So I'm very excited um, to co-host with my dear friend Faith here. Our main program is going to be an hour. Um, at the end of that hour, we're going to have a three-minute um, intermission because um, some people are going to have to jump off right then. But when we return, we'll have a 30-minute Q&A with our panelists and we'll uh, have some more thoughtful discussion. So to tell you um, a tiny little bit um, about the Baha'i Faith, just to give you kind of a little bit of background uh, foundation. We believe that we are living at a time, um, a great day of God foretold by each of his messengers in the past. These are the revealers of all major religions. Um, and these divine educators are connected. They're all connected to one another and they're connected to us. Their messages are progressive, leading mankind forward through new levels of humanity, love and unity. The latest manifestation from the Baha'i vantage point is Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. That is the title of Baha'u'llah. And he is the latest manifestation or revealer, divine revealer from God. Um, his overarching and the most essential mission of Baha'u'llah is the unification of the entire human race, the oneness of mankind and humanity. Um, when we talk about this reality of us being one, uh, we recognize that you know, race is a social construct. It's, we are the one, one human race, but racism in the ways that we are impacted is very real. And we're going to explore that today. How can we get closer to Baha'u'llah's mission of the oneness of humanity? In the words of Jesus, um, in, the, in the Lord's prayer, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is destined for us to be one. One of the very unique aspects of this revelation is that when Baha'u'llah passed, he left a covenant, he left a will and testament to make sure that there would never be division within our faith, to make sure that humanity, religion was one. And he left the honor and the responsibility of keeping the Baha'i faith united to his son, Abdu'l-Baha. And Abdu'l-Baha was appointed as this very key aspect in religious history so that we would always have unity, the central point around which every teaching of the Baha'i faith revolves. A little more about Abdu'l-Baha. Uh, he spent 60 years of his life as a prisoner in exile, um, accompanying his father in um, prisons beginning at the age of eight um, for four successive exiles. He was remaining actually under house arrest um, in Israel, and after his release, Abdu'l-Baha, his son, traveled to America. And at the age of 68, over a period of 239 days, he proclaimed his father's message, the message of Baha'u'llah, the oneness of mankind. So far and wide, hundreds of gatherings across the country, he continued to proclaim this message, sharing with all who would listen um, that the, one, the, the, the newest manifestation has come and his revelation is around unifying the entire planet. Here's a quote from Abdu'l-Baha. This is an illumined age. That which is confirmed is the oneness of the world of humanity. Every soul who serveth this oneness will undoubtedly be assisted and confirmed. As Baha'is, it is our highest aspiration to usher in this new age by upholding the principles of justice, unity, and oneness. You know, when Abdul Baha came to this country in the early 1900s, he did revolutionary things. He was, it was not a time for black and white people to come together. He would put African-Americans at the head of the table. You know, he was a revolutionary and we are asked to be revolutionaries in this day and age. Baha'u'llah wrote in 1859, O son of spirit, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. He later went on to write, the light of men is justice. Quench it not 
with the contrary winds of oppression and tyranny. The purpose of justice is the appearance of unity among man. It is not possible for us in this nation to have unity without first having justice. Absolutely. We're really going to get into it today and have a great time with our friends at Baha'i Teachings who are doing great work. I want to tell you all a little bit about Bahia. Um, she is a dear sister friend of mine. We've been um, cohorts for quite some time, and I love her dearly. Um, she's quite something. She's got a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in social work, and is completing her PhD in social work research. Um, she seems to really be following in the steps of her mother, um, Dr. Joy DeGru. Um, great shoes to uh, fill. Um, she is currently the executive director of the Black Parent Initiative, but he is the vice president for Joy DeGruy Publications, assisting Dr. DeGruy in researching historical trauma and co-developing new models and methods for culturally responsive services and delivery. Um, soon to be Dr. Overton, has also associated with training and development for government agencies and creating and sustaining equitable policies and practices. I know firsthand what a dear friend she is, what a dear sister and daughter she is. Um, so without further ado, that's, this is Bahia. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you, Faith. And, you're, and Faith is also biased because we're good friends. But um, I'll tell you a little bit about Faith. First of all, um, faith is her name. She exudes faith and confidence and hope in, in situations where most people would not. So I have to tell you, she lives her name. Um, she's worked in the field of race relations uh, for over 30 years. And I, I've been a witness to a lot of those years. Um, and she's inspired by the Baha'i teachings to do so. She's been a champion for social justice in several different um, capacities. Um, and she co-founded Oneness, which was a national nonprofit organization fighting racism and promoting oneness. Um, she worked also with Dr. Joy DeGru for years. Um, and she has also recently become an entrepreneur. Um, she's now embarking on this new chapter. I'm very excited for her. Um, it includes training and coaching and writing and creating new content around social justice, uh, around mindfulness and meditation. So that is my dear friend, Faith. And she also makes killer ice cream. If you ever get a chance to have some, please have some. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bahia. Without further ado, we're gonna um, introduce our panelists for today. And then we're gonna open with some artist an artistic presentation, which is soon to sure to be uplifting and insightful. Our first panelist is Liz Dwyer. She is the managing editor and director of operations for BahaiTeachings.org. Welcome, Liz. We have been friends for uh, 30 years. <laughs> a long time. Um, honored to serve on this panel with you today. Prior to joining the team, Liz served as the communications director for 826 National, along with freelance writing for various national print and digital outlets. Liz worked as the managing ed editor at shalondaland.com and worked as the education and cultural editor for Take Part the digital arm of participant media, and as the educator, education editor at Good Magazine. Uh, when we met, she was at Northwestern University in the northern suburbs of Chicago. And um, thank you so much, Liz. It's exciting to be with you today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yay. Um, I'd like to introduce our next panelist. That's um, Payam Zamani. Um, he's an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and investor. He's the founder, chairman, and CEO of the One Planet Group, um, which is a hybrid tech firm that runs in a, a suite of online technology and media businesses. Um, he also supports Bahia Honey, my business, in a lot of ways. Um, in 2020, Payam was recognized as the best CEO for diversity by Comparably. Um, the best CEO for diversity ranking is derived from an anonymous sentiment, ratings of employees um, of color, uh, those who are not Caucasian, about their chief executive officers um, during a 12-month period. And um, definitely, uh, we will learn more about Baha'iTeachings.org, which is um, 
he was inspired to create and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but welcome Payam. Thank you so much Bahia and Faith. It's so good to be with you from Haifa. Oh, right. No, no, it's just a building behind me. No, it's virtual background. <laughs> and I would like to invite Masood to join us. Masood Olafani is an Atlanta-based multidisciplinary artist, actor, and writer. He is a graduate of Morehouse College and the Savannah College of Art and Design, where he received an MFA in sculpture in 2013. He's a former artist in residence at the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center. He is co-host of Retro Report on PBS. He hosts the podcast America's Most Challenging Issue and is a contributing writer for Bahaiteachings.org, in addition to the many other things he does. So Masood, welcome. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Bahia. Good to be with you guys. We're so happy to have you here. Um, so last, uh, certainly not least, um, I would love to introduce to you Radiance Tally, if you would like to join us. Um, Radiance is a lovely human being, um, dearly, um, hearted, I guess I would say she leads with her heart. Um, she radiates love, right? Um, she's a staff writer for Bahaiteachings.org. She's also a poet, a speaker, and a visual artist. Um, she seeks to raise awareness of injustices and promote healing from prejudice, foster an increased appreciation for unity and diversity through all of her works. She studied journalism and communication at the University of Maryland. And in her free time, she enjoys co-hosting workshops on social justice. That's, that's a good thing to like to do in, in your spare time, uh, but it's not easy work, I'm sure. Um, she's written two books of original poetry and she hopes to get them published soon. Um, today, we are so lucky that she is going to share one of those poems with us to get us started um, on our journey, our conversation today. So with, um, with that, I'm gonna turn that over to, to you, Radiance. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, the, I'm gonna share a poem. I've written called Ignorance as a Choice. And um, just to, to preface um, this poem, because uh, I've written um, hundreds of poems and sometimes some of my poems are in series. And this poem is in a series called The Island, which is a metaphor for my heart and love and trust and the need for, and, and I've, there are in the previous poems in this series, I. I illustrate, I, you know, I use this metaphor of me being the princess inside a castle on an island and with guards and whatnot to illustrate the need to, for safety and protection and healing that many um, women and people of color need from racism and oppression and, and ignorance. So here's my poem called Ignorance is a Choice. And I, I wrote this poem because uh, I was after in being inspired by many conversations from people who, you know, either who made excuses for their ignorance or made excuses for uh, oppression. So. Ignorance is so annoying and odd. So I've resolved to create a woke squad. I'll be waiting on the island. If you're educated, come apply. I want people who are activists, who actually care to try. It's strange that people don't know and they can learn everything else, but ignore hate crimes each day. They could have educated themselves. Privilege makes ignorance a choice. You're not reminded of your skin and you're given more of a voice so news channels have a spin. It's a choice to only surround yourself with whites and not hear about those who are denied their rights. It's a choice to not reflect on your life and wonder why groups always have strife. It's a choice to side with the perpetrators and ignore the victims as if they're haters. It's a choice to be irritated with those who are bleeding and say it's all in the past so we should not be grieving. It's a choice to avoid guilt and pain and since your life may not require strain. It's a choice to let us keep being attacked 
you pretend to wonder why as you step back. It's a choice to not know the system that you benefit from and think so many Blacks are poor because they are dumb. It's a choice to believe stereotypes that are a lie and not watch live videos of a dying man's cries. It's a choice to believe that you get a pass from knowing our world because of your class. It's a choice to think that you don't need to get involved. Racism has never been our problem to resolve. So I'm looking for people who actually care, who will stand up for us and actually be there. I'm looking for people who care about our plight, who will safeguard and support us to win the fight. Because if you love us, you'll fight for our rights. So I'm no longer wasting time with people who don't care, who don't think there's a problem and thus don't have time to spare. I'm spending time with people who think my life matters, not those who would rather waste their time with vain chatters. If you're riding in a car, you're allowed to go far. You don't have to worry about suddenly dying while your child sees you get shot and starts crying. You don't have to worry if, if you're holding a toy gun or fear that the police will plant drugs on your young son. It's a privilege to get far less time for any violent or minor crime. And you get to avoid going in the prison system even if you photograph yourself raping a victim. This privilege is not healthy. It's letting you escape your wrongs and it makes the innocent pay. The victim list is so long. You don't have to worry about being fodder for, for prison and keep track of the alt-right incidents that have risen. You don't have to worry about being accepted. And I'm frankly tired of us being rejected. So I'm looking for people who understand what's going on, who are passionate about justice and want to right all the wrongs. I'm looking for people who respect our spirit, who nurture our vision and want to hear it. I'm looking for people who are glad we exist, whose thoughts are not motivated by prejudice. I'm looking for people who care about me, who are helping people of my ethnicity. And sometimes it's unfortunate that this is hard to see. It's sad that it's rare for me to find woke peers, but I've become patient from waiting for years. So interested prospects may apply. I'm looking for those who care to try. The island is beautiful and the princess is sweet, but only the devout and committed get a seat. Thank you. That was amazing. You can always tell when things are um, inspired by real life uh, experiences, right? When you, when people, um, artistic expression or poetry. Um, and um, I would love to uh, kind of invite any of our panelists or actually all of our panelists to uh, speak on um, just any parts of that poem that um, resonated with you or that you stuck out to you, that you can relate to, or that um, you connected with. I'll jump into it, but yeah, um, that was, you know, had me almost about to cry. Uh, and it really, I think, spoke to a lot of the why for why we do this work and why we approach the topic of racial justice in the way that we do. Um, so much of what Radiance was just talking about is this is not a game, you know? And she didn't directly name the names, but Emmett Till, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Ayanna Jones, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and too many other black women and children in this nation have lost their lives. And the inhumanity and injustice that black people have experienced since we've landed on these shores 400 years ago. It runs through my veins and it runs through everyone else's who may not be of African descent. And we've all eaten, it's soaked into the soil, into the very fabric of this country. And we've all eaten from its poison fruits. But what Radiance is talking about, and I think what really drives our work is that we have the opportunity now to actually plant new seeds and grow something new and eat from the fruits of unity and justice and truthfulness. So, Yes, girl. Amen. I am. Your reflections. Oh, wasn't that amazing? I mean, that uh, poetry, 
and what Radiance just shared with us um, is so touching, so uh, powerful, uh, so potent. There's so much in there. I mean, every verse has so much pain, suffering, and uh, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it just feels like if the society as a whole um, wasn't so, um, I guess, not caring about each other, um, would immediately see the power in that and, and what the solutions are, the love and unity um, that can really bring us all together. I mean, I can tell you that um, I, as, as an immigrant, um, who can never understand um, what uh, the situation for African-Americans has been like in this country, growing up in this country. Um, I feel so um, blessed to be able to work with people like Radiance, Liz, Masood, and many, many others. Um, you know, I'm often reminded of my own experience growing up in Iran as a Baha'i and all the challenges that we had getting beaten up for being a Baha'i, getting expelled from school. But the fact is, if I was, if I would go from one city to another, nobody knew me, nobody would beat me up. And it, it, there was nothing on me. There was nothing that, that communicated immediately that I'm different. So there is a reason um, that this is referred to as America's most challenging issue. And um, I feel like as immigrants, um, whatever high you or not, doesn't matter. As immigrants, if we don't become part of the solution, we are part of the problem. We're an accomplice because we're taking advantage of a country and a system that was built partly unjustly. And um, we cannot just say I wasn't here. We cannot say my ancestors were not here. I'm benefiting from the so-called American dream. Well, how did that come about? And what is going to be my role to play you know, a productive role so I'm not just perpetuating a wrong system? Thank you, Payam. I wanted to add that um, there is a box down at the bottom for questions and answers. So feel free um, as we go along to write them. We will come back to them after our presentations. Um, Masood, did you have some reflections you'd like to offer? Oh, I don't know how to add too much onto what uh, Liz and Pyam have said. I think they've covered a lot of ground. Um, I think for me, Radiance's poem, and I think um, all art uh, that is revealing something really significant about the human experience is important work. And I think at the heart of her poem, is this idea of making visible what has historically been invisible. And I think it's so important for us to continue to bring to light um, the realities of our existence and the things that we have ignored. Otherwise you get an incomplete picture of the society that you live in and, um, and the circumstances that you find yourself in. I think also what's quite beautiful is in what she shared is the courage um, to be vulnerable, to be transparent. Um, and I always find that inspiring. Um, that's a quality for me that all great art has. And it's also deeply affirming as an African-American man to hear that truth spoken in a poetic form and to feel the visibility of myself in the context of her words and the way she framed it. And so, you know, I think that's part of what we try to do at Baha'i Teachings in dealing with the issue of race is in the context of writing, of, of content, of cultural content, is to bring to light things that people either have ignored, aren't aware of, our need to reflect on and deepen on a deeper level. And so fundamentally it's about that courage and that transparency and that love for humanity, a love that doesn't compromise with the truth. 
that is committed to revealing the truth, to shedding light on it, and to uh, joining hand in hand and arm in arm with our brothers and sisters as we work through this most vital and challenging issue. Um, and so I'm just grateful to, to, to her for sharing that and for contextualizing that reality um, um, in art and poetry, which is such a profoundly important way um, to talk about our reality. It lifts the spirit. The Baha'i writings say art is, is a ladder for the soul. And what Sheep so beautifully demonstrated was um, how true that is. Um, so I'm grateful to her and, um, and, and, and uh, thank you for that contribution, Radius. Mm -hmm. I think um, this is such a unique space for all of us, I think, right? Um, and we're um, all on this particular panel and, and Faith and I are Baha'is. Um, and so we recognize that oneness of uh, mankind, the reality that race is a social construct and we are one human race, we are one human family. And so knowing that and then experiencing the antithesis of that in our daily lives is a struggle, right? It's a struggle. and. Um, one of the questions that we wanted to kind of ask you is, and, and kind of feeds off of what Radiance was saying in terms of it being a choice. Everyone who's here has made a choice to engage in this work, right? They made a choice. It's, you can, I could go and I could just, you know, be a dentist and just say, I just a dentist, <laughs> I don't see anything. But really thinking about the ways that we are using our lives and, our, and earning our living by working towards this mission of the Baha'i faith, super critical, right? We're family. Um, but how do we demonstrate our dedication to family, right? Somebody jumps on, you know, Liz's son, I'm jumping in, <laughs> Get it? you know, I'm not necessarily going to stand nearby and say prayers for the situation. There's a part of that that has to get act, you have to get activated. And so I guess I want to pose to, um, I'll pose it to Liz actually to say, you know, what is your why? You know, why are you doing this? It's certainly not easy work. But what is your why? You know, um, I'm originally from the Chicagoland area, and I came out to Los Angeles in 1998 uh, as a Teach for America Corps member, and I was assigned to teach in Compton, California. Which this was, as you if you if you check the timeline, this was six years after the the Los Angeles uprising, after the brutal beating of Rodney King. So. You know, I had a classroom of, of uh, African-American and uh, Latino students who were all from low-income families uh, that their circumstances living in Compton were not accidental, you know, and that becomes very clear. It's not an accident, it is all deliberate policy. But I taught those students, I told them my goal was for them to be able to take their rightful place in society and to heal, to unite, to build true bonds of friendship and fellowship. And, you know, I worked in South Los Angeles in Compton, Watts, you know, all the sections of Los Angeles that people say don't go to for 10 years. That was my first 10 years in LA. And I would see the difference if I was coming from, from you know, there's no bookshops down there, food deserts, uh, trash all over the place. Again, that is deliberate. And, you know, I think you see just the, the magnitude all across this country and because what, we, what happens in the United States ripples across the world. And so you see the damage. I lived in China in the mid 1990s and saw the racist, you know, cops is on TV over there and the country wasn't even open yet, right? So you see what is exported around the world and the damage that that does, but you also see the opportunity that if we are able to fix this, if we are able to actually solve this challenge, we have the opportunity to be a beacon of light for the rest of the world. If we can solve this most vital and challenging issue, which affects all of us, not just black folks. Yes, we are dying disproportionately from COVID, right? more than any other group. Native Americans have the highest infection rate, but they're 1% of the population. We have the highest death rate and we're only 12% of the population. So we are affected disproportionately, but we are all sick. But you know, the, 
again, it's that piece of being able to take your rightful place in society. And we can't even imagine what our nation could look like because we have stunted our growth because of our commitment to racism. So what does it look like? People don't know. They're like, what does it actually look like to have a model of unity? What would our society look like? And that's what I want to get to. Thank you, Liz. You know, one of the passages from the Baha'i writings, Baha'u'llah says, the essence of faith is the fewness of words and the abundance of deeds. He whose words exceeds his deeds, no verily his death is better than his life. And I think about that quote in the context of racial healing and our charge as Baha'is, what we must do to arise. So thank you for being the beacons, some of the beacons that we have in this community. I wanna ask Radiance if she would take the next question. And I wanna talk about the purpose for engaging in this work. Can you? Tell us a little bit about what the purpose for you is in engaging in this work. So engaging in social justice work in general or for Baha'i teachings? Social justice work and Baha'i teachings, please. Okay. Um, well, the, the purpose of well, engaging in all this work is to change minds and hearts. You know, we, we have a, a lot of... Um, oppression in this country. And, and unfortunately with, you know, 75% of white Americans not having a minority in their social network, uh, most of white America is unfortunately unaware of the plight and uh, oppression and, and pain of people of color. And so in order to have change, one, you need education, um, which is a big part of the of what I try to do is just educate, bring, raise awareness of these injustices. And um, yeah, and you also need um, motivation to change as well. And you also need examples of what this uh, race unity looks like in practice. And I also love to spotlight those stories in my article as well as what does it look like when uh, Baha'is are, you know, living this life and practicing uh, what does it look like when white Baha'is are practicing this, you know, supreme effort and, um, in, in history? And what does it look like, you know, when they are, you know, overcoming this um, sense of superiority and patronizing attitude? And, and, you know, what does it look like when, you know, Black people in turn, you know, are able to not be suspicious when they have examples of, 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 of trust and, and reasons to trust and, and have and what everybody needs to do for this racial healing in this country. Um, yeah, you know, so I, I engage in this work for, for change, to, to raise awareness, to hopefully inspire to motivation and to be some sort of catalyst for some person to um, get involved in social action and, and just start and be their own, be the change they wanna see in the world. Thank you, um, Radiance. Um, this is an interesting, it's very complicated in some ways and so simple in other ways, right? It's just like, it's so dumb. I was thinking about this, you know, like, it's just, it's, I feel like they were like the, the, the nation is like the flat earth society, you know, <laughs> it's like, I, this is why we think it's flat earth. And then later we were like, really? They thought flat earth? That's how I feel like we were going to look at us with this racism stuff. Like, this is some ridiculousness. Um, but that brings me to my next question is really is around being a Baha'i Understand the reality of man is that we are one, right? Understanding that racism is very real, even if race is not. And then being a Baha'i who's charged to promote and establish justice and, the, and unity is hard to do. So when you think about being a Baha'i and when people, when you're trying to advance these notions, and sometimes there are Baha'is that I, I feel honestly you know, they want to high five at the finish line without running the race. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 that's, that's always for the photo op at the end. So how do we lovingly, because we all love Baha'u'llah, we all recognize the reality of this, this dispensation that we're in. How do we, how do you, I'll ask you this question because I'm not the one in the hot seat. <laughs> how do you balance that out? Like, how do you do that? I'm going to, I'm going to um, pose that to um, Masood. 
I'm just asking you, how do you reconcile what some people would feel is a disconnect between working for unity and working for justice? You know, there's a, a, a really, the, the faith is wonderful in terms of giving us some really fundamental directives in terms of how we grow. Principle among those is this whole idea of bringing thyself to account each day, right? So reflecting on the choices that I've made during the course of the day um, and then determining whether or not most of those choices have been in alignment with what I say I believe and to give myself a, a congratulatory pat on the back and a you know, gratefulness to God for having walked the path at least um, um, that straightforwardly. And then the things that I fall short on asking God for forgiveness. So there's that aspect of that daily discipline of bringing thyself to account each day, a kind of honest reflection of where I am. And then racism is held as being America's most vital and challenging issue, right? Vital meaning important but also vital, vital having some relationship to the equilibrium of the body, of the body politic, right? So when we go, we get injured, we go to the hospital, the doctor looks at our vital signs. This looks good, this doesn't look so good, we need to make some adjustment here, scribe some medication to get the body back whole and synchronized. For me, there's a link between that practice of bringing thyself to account each day and racism being America's most vital and challenging issue. So what I'm saying is, is, is if I'm supposed to bring myself to account each day, and that is my prescriptive practice towards spiritual growth and development. And I've also been told that racism is the most vital and challenging issue. Part of my prescriptive practice should be a reflection on how I'm dealing with the issue of race. So that to me seems fundamental to the process. I think part of the challenge as Baha'is, we come in contact with this revelation, which we have been assured is the greatest revelation that has ever existed in human history, right? The challenge that we have is to not adopt an attitude of a kind of racial, racialized arrogance in the sense that by coming in contact with the revelation, somehow I'm cured from the issue of racism. So that the faith becomes a proxy for my unresolved feelings of racial identity or racial or racism, right? It becomes a means to couch that which I have chosen not to examine, which is the work. That's the work, is to have that honest dialogue to wrestle with myself, to say, you know what? To ask myself those hard questions, to point out those hard revelations about myself. You know, I got on that elevator with that guy the other day and he was a large bald headed black man. And I felt some kind of way about that. And ooh, that is hard to, to admit to myself, but we have to go through that to move towards the healing. So I think for me, it's, it's, it's having the ideal of the oneness of mankind, which Baha'u'llah is defined as the core principle of the faith around which all the other principles revolve. That's the main objective, right? That's where we're moving towards. But in the process of moving towards that destiny, towards that inevitability, also having a clear, realistic reckoning with who I am as I'm doing this work so that I know what I need to work on. What is the poison that's in my system? And I'm gonna say this and then I'm gonna shut up because I know I can go on, but I'm passionate about this stuff. We all hate racism as a practice, right? That's why we're here gathered together. But don't ever disrespect it as a successful system. It has existed for 401 years. There is an evil and diabolical spirit to it, but it is also freaking brilliant. So what I'm saying is don't think that you have not been impacted by racism in some form or fashion, whether you've been born in this country, whether you're an immigrant, and I love the way that Payam uh, articulated his positionality, right? Which is that he was an immigrant to this country and talking about how you could never understand fully the plight of black people in America, but also positioning himself as a coworker in doing the work while at the same time holding in context his reality. So we have to 
reckon with the brilliance of the system. And there's a certain amount of humility that comes as a result of that reckoning and understanding that to expunge myself of that evil spirit that is at the core of racism, I've got to know how it functions. And I have to understand how I've been impacted by it. So it's focusing on the goal for me, this is mine, but also who is Masood as I'm working towards that goal? I've got to work on this, I've got to look at this and never forget conscious and unconscious feelings of superiority. Those things which we're aware of and those things which we are not aware of and they only come out when the circumstance and the moment is right and you say something and you don't know where it came from. Ah, I've got some work to do, but that's the work. That's the work. Up the mic, but I'd love for anyone else to also, uh, if, if Payam would like to speak about how he does that, balances those two things out. And Liz and Radio. After Masu talking, I'm not sure if I dare to go, but I, I, I will make an attempt. You know, I was just uh, before this uh, panel, I was reading the July 22 letter from the uh, Universal House of Justice again. And uh, there's a section that this letter um, quotes uh, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, Shori Fendi. And the guardian says, the American Baha'i community, the living, destined to live in the whole, the guardian admonished, cannot hope to either escape the trials with which this nation is confronted, nor claim to be wholly immune from the evils that stain its character. We cannot be in a pool and not get wet. We're in it. So the question is how much we're inflicted with this illness, not that if we are or we're not, we are. And what are we going to do to, um, to, to address it? What is going to be our role? And in the same letter, one paragraph to the last, the House of Justice tells us, ultimately the power to transform the world is affected by love, love originating from the relationship with the divine, love ablaze among members of a community, love extended without restriction to every human being. And the fact is, I, I, I believe it was uh, Masood said it, um, or maybe it was Radiance, that we need to see a change of hearts. The laws, although important, and they are essential, they're the foundation of any society that, that runs properly, but we need a change of hearts. It, it reminds me, it's, it's not completely related to this subject. One of the CEOs of a Fortune 500 company recently was questioned about some of their practices. He said, unethical is not illegal. Make it illegal, I won't do it. The way that that CEO will stop doing what he's doing is by hoping that we can somehow touch his heart and change his heart. How do you change hearts? It's through spiritual transformation. And I think that is why the House of Justice reminds us it is through that relationship with the divine that we are able to change hearts. Short of spiritual transformation, um, I think it is going to be a massive challenge. And that is why I personally feel that for me, the work that Baha'i Teachings does um, is valuable. You know, I, I love the way Masood framed taking myself to account each day because I don't think that that's something that but if you're not a Baha'i, you may have never heard of that concept before. However, maybe if you're in the meditation community, you might know a little bit about that. But where do people go with that? So one of the things that Shoghi Effendi says, let the white make a supreme effort in their resolve to lose their usually inherent, at times, subconscious sense of superiority. So if it's usually inherent and subconscious, how do we take ourselves to account for that? You know, how do we reflect, look in the mirror each day and face who we are, where we fell down, where we succeeded, how we get up, 
you know, a lot of people put on a happy face and show up to community events that are diverse and beautiful, but may not be having real conversations. So how do we engage in real conversations that lead to healing? How does Baha'iteachings.org do that, Payam? Maybe you could take that first, mm -hmm. since your story here. So um, it's interesting. First, I'm going to touch on bringing ourselves to account. And I really think that um, I, I, I believe it was um, uh, Joy uh, de Gru who said this, that we have lots of beautiful quotes in the Baha'i faith. And what do we do with those beautiful quotes? Do they manifest themselves in action? And um, I think when Maso talks about bringing ourselves to account is me bringing myself to account to truly think about the outcome of my actions. If I run a company, I need to be able to look at my executive team to my, look at my team, is there diversity? If there isn't, doesn't matter what quotes I care about, doesn't matter why, what I believe in. Well, it is not manifesting itself in action. Then that, that is the truth of it. That's, and I have to be honest about that. Um, so with Baha'i teachings, uh, we've had over the years, of course, uh, I mean, we're still learning. And, um, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm much happier to be learning with, you know, Liz, uh, leading the editorial work and then of course, you know, Masood and Radiance involved. But it has been a major learning process for us over the past, I think nine years since we started the effort. And um, um, over the years, we have clearly made mistakes. We have had uh, articles that have been tone deaf. We have had, um, we have taken on approaches that I would not take today because what we know now, we didn't know back then. And the chances of what we'll know 10 years from now, we don't know today. Um, but the idea of covering this subject has been very important to us. I remember that uh, one of the best presentations ever done um, uh, on, on the stage, on the Baha'i teaching stage was by Masood, that he delivered that um, at the Grand Canyon Baha'i Conference. And um, it was, um, uh, the headline was, freeing ourselves of the stain of racism. And I think that was one of the most powerful talks that anyone has ever delivered that I've been able to see. But that was the idea behind Baha'i Teachings, creating a platform so voices like that could be heard and both Baha'is and those who are interested in the Baha'i faith to be able to, in a sense, hear the voice of Baha'is as they are um, in action, trying to make the world a better place not just theory. And that has always been a hope, especially uh, with, with some of the work that, that you've seen, you know, done through the video conversations, through uh, the podcast that we have distributed. It has been able, it has been our focus to put the spotlight on individuals who are living it in action. So we can learn from them. We can take those and hopefully take them to our own communities and put them to work. I wanted to give Liz an opportunity or uh, Radiance, if you wanted to um, speak to that. Well, I'll say, I'll say this, I've worked in media for a really long time and I've worked on teams where, well, I'll just say like, for example, the Associated Press until um, just a couple years ago, refused to capitalize the word black. And so no AP reporter could do that. Or if you were a media outlet that followed AP style, you did not capitalize black. Um, and sitting in editorial meetings where, uh, you're told that you can't describe something that is clearly racism as racism, okay? You have to use racially tinged or racially motivated or, you know, something like that, euphemisms, when you're like, no, this is, this is racism. And then you get told, well, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about issues, not, you know, attacking people. And it's like, well, yes, we're not attacking people, but we are talking about what individuals did, okay? When Dylan Roof, murdered nine people in a church in Charleston, South Carolina. That is not racially motivated. That is racism showing up with deadly consequences, right? So I think that one of the things that I do appreciate about the team at Baha'i Teachings is, is that everyone is clear that there is a problem, okay? Everyone's clear. We, we know, you know, when, 
when Baha'u'llah, who is, you know, the prophet and founder of the Baha'i faith said in the 19th century, he said that the well-being of mankind, its peace and security are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. Okay, so that's a foundation, you know. When Baha'u'llah said that truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues, that's a, that's a baseline, okay? That cuts out the let's use euphemisms for racism type discussion, okay? And, you know, so, so I think about that. I think about, you know, when you, we all know the pen is mightier than the sword, okay? And I've been writing and editing for a really long time in that regard, as has Masood, as has Radiance, you know? Um, and, and you see how the words that you can choose to use can motivate people to, as, as Masood said, and that, that quote, brother, is, is one of my, that is my go-to quote every, you know, bring myself to account each day, okay? Because am I writing things in a way that get people to not just think, but to take action, to think about where are you deciding to live? Where are you choosing to send your children to school? Who's actually in the pictures of your wedding, your anniversary party, your funeral? Do they all look like you or is there just a sprinkle of diversity? Do the people that are on your group chat, do they all look like you? Is the person who just stops by and, you know, since it's COVID time and they holler outside your window, what's up girl? Do they look like you? Who do you text in the morning be like, hey girl, what's up? Do you have intimate, spontaneous friendships with people from a different color or background? If the answer is no, then we have work to do. And that is the mindset that I'm writing with. The other thing I'll say about this is that so much of media is written with a white gaze in mind. How can we get white people to be nicer to black people? I'm actually, you know, and this is just Liz speaking, my entire life I've written with a black gaze in mind. We all have stuff that we had to do, but I think about it in terms of, as I said, this is not a game. This is my family. These are my family members, okay? If my family reads this, how will they feel? Will they see their inherent nobility reflected in these words? Will they know that they're not good just because someone white said they're good, but because God said they're good, because God said they're worthy. That is the mindset that I go and show up with every single day. Word, you know? word, word. So <laughs> I think that that matters because so much of media, when you when you look at it, is is not taking that into consideration. We we you know. Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, we, we saw it, you know, this week all play out, you know. <laughs> but but I, I just, I feel like that is such an important distinction to make, to, to recognize and have the ability to understand that anti-Blackness is real. And I don't have to ask you whether you agree with me or not on it, because I know it's real. And guess what? My faith told me you don't have to participate in that anymore. Yep. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, that is, this has been so robust and I love it. It's like a shot in the arm because I I tend to be in circles where I'm the, the one dissenting voice saying, uh, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. We can't, the, uh, the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity. So we have to do the justice part. And, you know, and I, and, and, and I think that when we start thinking about just like what you're saying in terms of the gaze and the intentions, you know, if I'm looking at your Facebook page and all your fans are, are not look like anybody, but I'm not going to be a little sprinkling. You just want to look, <laughs> to even it out. Right. I want to have meaningful um, connections. And we talked about this. I mean, in my community, I talked about this. I'm like, if we're family, if we're family, then, and, and I'm your, you're my Baha'i family. Then if I'm suffering, you're suffering, right. Exactly. If they're beating me up in the street, we don't form a circle and say a round of unity prayers. That's not what's, the, we, that is something you can do on the side after you get these people up off of me. And I think that is a part that I think Baha'i teachings, um, all of us in our social justice work have committed ourselves to, we know what the goal is, but there's a lot of splinters 
and clawing and some throwing some bows to get to where we got to get. You know what I'm saying? Knuck if you buck. Like <laughs> this is for me. <laughs> if you're not, if you're not about to do this for unity, and you know what I'm talking about, right? If you pop up on me, that's what that means. I'm gonna you have my back. That's how I want to feel about my Baha'i community. And Baha'u'llah, and let me just be, this is my last little, I'm not gonna, I know I'm not supposed to be a panelist, but I have to say this. When teach, we think sister, about, teach. We think about <laughs> Abdul Baha, Abdul Baha was an amazing um, anti-racist activist. You're talking about someone from another country who didn't speak a lot of English coming to this country and demanding that Baha'is break the law on the side of what is moral. Yeah. He said, where is Mr. Gregory? Bang on the table, right? They asked, can we, can we have segregated feasts? He said, you can, the Baha'is will meet together. This was not legal, okay? This was not, well, we have to think about what it means in the community and what, oh, well, we need to think about. Abdul Baha was willfully supporting us in breaking the law towards what is moral and just and correct and aligned with his father's revelation. And that's the truth. So, so some of what happens to me when I look at people and I'm going, do you really think Abdul Baha would have been shut down because he wanted to create a unified space when there's injustice staring us in the face? I mean, that's just me, but I don't think so. And so when I think about our intentions and our impact, they have to align. If your intentions are great, but the impact is harm, I don't care how many quotes you read. I don't care how much time you think that you're, you, you have arrived, you're not gonna get to that point. And so how do we, in loving conversation, but critical conversation, push on our fellow Baha'is to say, okay, we recognize the oneness of mankind. We recognize this beautiful manifestation in his teachings. How do we put that into action that equals healing, repair, and justice so that we can have unity? All the rest of it, I don't have time. Yeah. You know, I would say, not, I think for everyone, because the, the, the magnitude of what is happening in the United States is, I think we, we all know where we were on January 6th, when people saw a Confederate flag in the US Capitol for the very first time. But the thing is, is I can drive 30 minutes north in LA County and see them too. You know, there is no racial nirvana anywhere in the United States. And if we don't collectively heal, we will continue to collectively suffer. So, you know, th this, is, this is the thing is that there is all a role to play. And it's not like I became a Baha'i and then there's just like a magic wand that gets wafted over at me that says, ta-da, you are now anti-racist. Like Masood said, you have to show up and figure out who I am in this process and what is it that I need to do to check myself, to, to hold myself to account, to see am I being a voice of someone who's telling the truth being morally upright, trying to heal myself so that I can heal my community and reach out with love and fellowship to other people so that I can, can be more trusting when I see the efforts that, that someone as wide is making, you know? Because there's responsibilities, you know, Shogi Effendi who is, is has this position as the guardian of the Baha'i faith, wrote a book length letter called The Advent of Divine Justice in, in the 1930s. And he assigned two roles to folks. White people have their responsibilities. Black folks have our own responsibilities, okay? And so I have to hold myself accountable for those responsibilities, you know, to myself, to, to, to make sure that when someone is trying to, to show that they are dropping their inherent sense of superiority, when they are attempting to have informal, you know, associations and bonds of true friendship and fellowship that that I say, okay, we're gonna do this. You know? And I, I can I see you striving. So I am going to not forget what happened because we 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 do honor our ancestors and what happened, but I'm gonna work with you to build something as we move forward. And it doesn't have to be all wrapped up in a shiny bow, you know, nice present or whatever. There's going to be setbacks. It's 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 a marathon to get there because we have centuries of healing to make up for. Abdul Baha, when he was in this country, um, was speaking of some Baha'i's homes in Chicago that had been bombed. And he talked about the destruction of America. And he said that if we don't address this issue, he said, hasten ye towards destruction. 
hasten ye towards devastation. And another passage, Shoghi Effendi quoting Abdu'l-Bahá said that there's an enemy of America stirring up the white race against the black race and the black race against the white race of which Americans are submerged in a sea of ignorance that we educate ourselves on these issues, that we are on the front lines doing this work is the vital call of the day. And the people who are on this panel are all a part of that um, charge. So thank you for your contributions. Before we go to break, um, I wanna give Radiance an opportunity to share, um, but it's too rich of a conversation to just cut it off. So I wanna give it to Radiance. We'll go to break um, and then we'll come back for questions and answers from the um, people who are out there watching. Radiance. So uh, can you refresh my memory of the question? Is it how we bring ourselves to account each day? Is it? <laughs> it was, it, this one was more around how do you stay aligned with working for justice and working for unity? Yes. Um, well, I, I mean, I, they're not mutu they're not mutually exclusive. So to work for justice is to work for unity, and and, and that's um, the way I see it. Um, yeah, because in order, you know, our a society can't be just unless you know all voices are at the table until all voices uh, matter and are, are valued and are heard until. You know, there is that bond of love between us all, where if one of us is hurting, then all of us are hurting and we're all standing up to work for these rights. And of course, when there's this love and, and this reckoning and, and atonement, that's when you can have this, this justice and healing um, in America. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Go to break. You know, I really encourage folks to, you know, I think Payam has said is that what he's right in what he said about like, you know, we don't get it right all the time. You know, I think that we are in a, a humble posture of learning in our approach to writing about it for me as an editor and all these sorts of things. I think like, for example, Radiance has been, um, uh, we partnered with, with uh, the Race uh, Unity Project, which was uh, a project uh, run by a uh, UK-based journalist named Celine Viancourt, um, and it was sponsored by Mazar Bahari, who um, also lives in the UK, who wanted to look at, at the um, response of the American Baha'i community to, to racism and our efforts for racial justice. So he interviewed, he went across the country and he interviewed people, and um, you know, it's just like short video clips of people talking about their experiences. And so Ra Radiance regularly writes about those um, she's written about, you know, the, um, the experiences of, of Baha'is who come from multiracial or biracial backgrounds and how that fuels their response to advocating for racial justice. Um, she has written, she's, her, Harriet Tubman is one of her ancestors. She's written about what it's like to have that spiritual legacy driving through a Baha'i perspective what she does. You know, Masood has written about, you know, his experiences with, with my, racial microaggressions and how he channels that through a Baha'i lens. He's written about, you know, if you've ever never seen the spook who sat by the door, I mean, that piece by Masood just floored me, the connection. So the thing is, we're living in the real world, you know? Um, we are living and breathing the same society that everyone else does. The thing is, is that we have this different lens that we're taking to the challenges that we're facing. So I really encourage folks to, to go to the site and check it out if you, if you haven't, um, and to, to engage with the contents. You, you may not like everything that you read and that's okay, you know? Um, but, but we are striving to be a voice and, and we are in a process of constant learning ourselves. So I think we can always get better. Excellent, thank you so much a nonprofit that I was a part of um, that was founded in 2000 called Oneness. Um, Songs of Hope and Unity will take us through the break, you know, to inspire people through whatever artistic mediums we can 
um, Masood being an actor and um, a writer and a poet and, you know, Radiance being all those things too. I mean, we've got such richness here on this panel today, um, such beauty and full breath of experience. With a mind of her own and a dream Somehow she knew that the road she would choose Would set us free In a way it kind of seemed a little strange That a little girl so young could make a change But she was different from the rest Had a voice that was blessed Made me believe Oh, I can hear This is a quote from Shoghi Effendi, and I really love this quote. And he, as we mentioned earlier, um, has was named the guardian of our faith, um, helped create and establish our administrative order so that we would uh, maintain unity in our faith. Um, Shoghi Effendi says, movements for social progress and social justice, as long as they are disassociated from both political and religious partisanship, should be supported by those Baha'is who feel urged to undertake such work. Consequently, there is no reason why you should not work for the betterment of your race through, ch through channels that in no way co um, conflict with our Baha'i attitude. Um, and I, I wanted us to bring that up because I think that a lot of trying to figure out that balance between um, being unity, unifying and working on behalf and advocating on behalf of our cultural groups or whoever, that we're not being separatist, that we're that part of that process of, of advocacy and uplifting, um, amplifying the voices of people who are not, who are kind of been muted. That is part of developing that. Um, and so I will go to our uh, wonderful Q&A. Uh, we had a question on there that was offered that was around, how do you reconcile um, a transformation happening from a social standpoint, working for social uh, justice, versus working for like a spiritual transformation, like that, that process, like what is the, what, what do you start with, I guess, right? The spiritual transformation, the social transformation, where do you bring them together? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think that we are, are trained to think in such dichotomies, but I think they go high, hand in hand, actually. Um, I don't think that you can have one without the other uh, because it is, it is the spirit that drives the action. Um, and if, if you don't, you, you know, there, there's a, Baha'is have, you know, sort of informally like of a, a five steps of prayer, you know, that we, 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 we oftentimes use. And if you, if you don't say you want to do something and you pray about it and then you say, okay, I'm going to meditate. And then I'm going to, I'm going to go with what comes to mind here that drives your action. And you may, may end up deciding like, you know what, this was not the right thing for me to do at this time, but that's okay because you're using this process. It feeds your soul in a different way. So then you're moving through the world a little bit differently. It's sort of like, um, I think it was your mom, but he, I don't know, I could be misremembering, mis I'm all misremembering, you know, my AAVE coming out there. But um, who was saying how like when you are in a room and someone is in a bad mood, you feel that energy, you know? You feel that energy around you. And so if I pray about it, if I'm meditating, if I'm grounding my actions in the spirit, that is also gonna have an effect. So I, I actually don't see how I make myself do anything if I'm not actually grounding it in the spirit. 
And I, and I think that that is actually one of the incredibly beautiful things about black culture in this country and how we have survived over the centuries and thrived and have been able to manifest such just joy despite hardship is because of our ability to inherently connect with our spirit and our, not just as an individuals, but our collective spirit. No, but yeah, I think that um, I agree with Liz that there is no differentiation between the two. I think that the work of um, changing uh, the hearts through spiritual transformation, through uh, um, introducing uh, Baha'u'llah's message uh, to the world. I think it, it is one and the same. It is, from my perspective, uh, it, it requires an interest and a commitment to a much bigger revolution of the way we think um, than frankly, any small group of resistance that you may see out in, in the society today. There is again, you know, there, there's a line from, sentence from, uh, the letter from the House of Justice that uh, to me, it's, 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 it's a guiding light that how Baha'i teachings can play a role. And it talks about it is not possible for you to affect the transformation and vision by Baha'u'llah merely by adopting the perspectives, practices, concepts, criticisms, and language of contemporary society. As much as at that moment, it may feel good, but that's not gonna bring about a change of hearts that through sharing the divine, through sharing the, the word of God, hopefully we're gonna be able to bring about lasting change. And, uh, and I think it is, uh, it is through sharing this message on an ongoing basis, by reflecting on our own practices on an ongoing basis. And uh, you know, I was really happy to see that during the break, you were sharing some of the uh, articles and, and, and different things that Baha'i Teachings has shared over the years. And I think it's through that, that we at Baha'i Teachings were able to play a role, sharing that message in everyday language that is representative of our own Baha'i inspired experiences. I am, um, but you know, when we look at, you know, one of the questions that came through on the chat, on the Q and A talked about white supremacy. And we have 400 years of oppression. And the quote that you just shared from the Universal House of Justice is beautiful. And when you have a group of people who have received such grievous mm -hmm. and slow healing wounds, you can't, you can't really help heal someone until you help address cleaning out the wound. So how do we do that? How do we mm -hmm. like go beyond the sometimes, you know, unity and diversity, um, oneness angle mm -hmm. and get into how it is that we get to the root of the matter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't suggest for a moment that I have an answer for that. Um, you know, as uh, I was reading through some of the questions that you all are posting, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a comment or question that somebody posted which was, don't you think that if they single a certain type of person, so-called people out um, and basically have this victim stance that it may perpetuate the problem. Basically, uh, if we stay away, if, if we don't talk about it, if we don't identify racism, then maybe, you know, I, I think that, and, and I wanted to touch on that and also touch on what you just mentioned. I think that, um, in my humble opinion, the House of Justice is helping us, guiding us to bring about lasting change while the approach um, in the short run may not seem as satisfying, but in the long term builds a foundation for change that is sustainable, that will, that will stay with us. Uh, that's my sense. I mean, unfortunately, you look at you look at the society we live in here in the U.S. Unfortunately, unless there is another atrocity that gets on the front page of the newspapers and CNN and so on, people are not going to get back on the street and try to fight the fight. So they're back at their home until another dramatic situation happens. That is, I think, what we are asked to stay away from, but rather have that consistent. Uh, sustained effort that we should be putting towards this, this work, whether or not 
uh, there is another dramatic situation that we're going to be reacting to, which we should react to that as well. Now, just commenting on, on, on this post, and I think that as, as uh, a white or, or someone who passes as, as, as white, um, I, I like to uh, comment on, on this post. And that is, I think it's easy to say that if, if we don't focus on race, uh, then and not have that victim mentality as this person suggests, then um, we won't perpetuate the problem. Now, I don't live the life of a black person in the US, but I know that if you walk to a store and immediately uh, people are concerned that uh, you know, uh, they, 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 they walk after you. Uh, if, um, uh, you're walking on the street. People may cross the street to walk from the other side. If uh, you apply for a job because your name sounds different, looks different, you may not be called uh, for an interview. These are real things that, that people are dealing with. Just trying to suggest that, you know, we're gonna ignore races and as a problem, and as, as a result, this problem will not perpetuate itself, I think is really, um, uh, not the right approach, and, and it's not uh, just uh, when we think about the kinds of lives people are living on a daily basis and the kinds of things uh, that they're addressing. Once we have a just society, once we have a society that is not a racist society, that we don't have institutional racism in that society, then we can probably suggest that, you know what, we can ignore race because that no longer is an issue. But until then, while you're fighting this, you're fighting for justice, I think it's very difficult to say that ignore it now. I was gonna also say that when we're talking about the universal justice seeding us for a, the long term, right? I look at this as it's a both end in our terms of our responsibility, right? So you have someone who's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna revolutionary, revolutionize the way that we do healthcare, right? And that's great. Someone's looking in the long term. How do we in the long term start to revolutionize and root out racist policy and root and I'm an EMT because <laughs> I'm like this guy is hemorrhaging right here so I got you on the long-term plan and I'm with it and I believe in it but our responsibility as we are moving towards that place is to stop the hemorrhaging when we see it and what I think happens a lot for individuals within our faith and external to the faith is that we want see the hemorrhaging mm -hmm. we're watching it and we go but you know this is the goal so I, I understand that you're hemorrhaging. And so for those people, it's not, it's calamity every day. It's a it's a major thing every day. Right. I had six police officers descend upon my house because an Uber driver said my son tried to rob her. OK, I had these are things that happen on a daily basis that are uh, unforeseen calamities for people on a day to day basis. So when we start to think about what our roles are as Baha'is, we have to figure out, we know what the goal is. We know what we're supposed to be. And in that process, what happens a lot of times too, and I'm sure a lot of folks here under, know, know this, is that because people don't want to acknowledge the hemorrhaging, it's negative, it's ugly, there's blood everywhere, okay? We don't want to talk about it. When they, when they don't want to acknowledge that hemorrhaging, and then they, they say, look at all these beautiful quotes that we have. And they give me give you those quotes, so maybe perhaps you won't worry about the hemorrhaging as much rather than saying these quotes fuel my responsibility as an EMT to start to address the problem while I work for the system to change and to shift, you know? Anyone else? Can I add something to that? You know, there's something about the nature of the, of the question, implicit in the nature of the question um, is something that is fundamentally problematic for me. And that is, first of all, the implication that, uh, which is a racist trope that black people play the victim card. I don't know what black people this individual knows. I come from a community of resilient, um, brilliantly innovative, um, creatively responsive to inhuman suffering. There's no victimhood in that. There's no playing the victim is. Now has my community been victimized without question? Without question, without question. But that doesn't mean that I go around 
beleaguered and playing and, and, and you know, just kind of uh, this kind of disempowered sense of helplessness and hopelessness about my circumstance. I come from a resilient people who respond creatively to our condition. That's not a, posi that's not a position of victimology. That's a position of agency, creative agency, which is a characteristic of nobility. So I would encourage that dear soul to get to know the black community because it seems to me implicit in that statement, you obviously don't know the people who you are talking about. So I just have to state that emphatically because I think we need to be clear about that. Now, at the same time, I don't have a problem with articulating clearly and emphatically my anger. Racism makes me angry. Sexism makes me angry. Classism makes me angry. Marginalization makes me angry. And if that's uncomfortable for you, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Abdul Baha says that there is one justifiable use for your anger. And as the Baha'i teachings are replete with cautions against anger rage, undisciplined anger. Abdu'l-Bahá says, anger is justifiable against the bloodthirsty tyrant. And if we think honestly, there is no greater manifestation in the bloodthirsty tyrant than the system of white supremacy. It has laid waste to entire populations. So yes, I'm angry, but how do I use that anger creatively, constructively, within the framework of the Baha'i teachings to build community, to break down division, to sow seeds of love and development in marginalized populations, recognizing that I don't have anything to bring to them, that they already come replete with riches and gems embedded within their society. It's my job to encourage that growth and development. In the advent of divine justice, the guardian Beloved Shoghi Effendi says that the master Abdu'l-Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, said that there were two qualities for which he had contempt for. Contempt is not a passive feeling. Contempt is not casual dislike or a kind of, that doesn't necessarily feel comfortable for me. He said contempt. Do you know what those qualities are? Criticism and impatience. So conversely, that indicates for me that he had a great love for patience and encouragement. And as we struggle doing this work at Baha'i teachings and whatever kind of community gatherings you're in and in different organizations and institutions, if we are not building cultures of encouragement and patience in doing this work, then we are failing even before we attempt to do the first initial act. Encouragement, patience. And lastly, I'll say this, to my white brothers and sisters, be ever mindful of taking a position of authority when it comes to offering a diagnosis or prescriptive response to racism. You don't know you haven't walked in our shoes. So pay me the respect and my community's respect by saying, I don't know how you feel as Payam so clearly articulated earlier, but I'm here with you, brother. I'm here with you, sister. I will bear witness to what you were going through and I will be your coworker in this work. That is a position of a humble posture of learning. Very difficult for some white people to accept because you've been accustomed to being at the forefront at the fore. The Baha'i faith says, assume a position, a humble posture of learning, humility, sincere humility. I don't know, but I'd like to learn. Can you help me understand? Encouragement, patience. Wow. This has been amazing. We have so many wonderful questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we're like we got, we got caught up in these ones and we just kind of rolled with it. Um, but <clears throat> I mean, I saw so many that talked about encouraging 
Baha'i communities to be courageous, right? Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Joy, who many people uh, referenced, also said, hey, you know, Baha'is have given their very lives for this faith. And are Baha'is now willing to stand in the rifle sites for their Black brothers and sisters? I mean, that's, that's the, the, the bottom, because, and literally that may be the question. But there are so many things for us to consider in this process, um, but we can't, we, we only have so much time. <laughs> so, oh, uh, Liz, when this, yes. You know, it's interesting because, um, you know, this, this question of white supremacy, you know, I think, I'm, I used to read the dictionary for fun and I'm a nerd, read encyclopedias. So, you know, my, my thing is always, you know, I like that the, the access, because there is no clergy in the Baha'i faith. And one of the main principles of the Baha'i revelation is the independent investigation of truth. So I'm the kind of person who will go to, you know, the Baha'i library online and type in the phrase white supremacy. And it's not there, right? But if you think about the, you know, time of the Baha'i revelation and the writings and whatnot, it, there wasn't the, the phrasing that was used. But there is a quote that, you know, the Baha'i writings say, that we should cast aside, cast away once and for all, the fallacious doctrine of racial superiority with all its attendant evils, confusions, and miseries. I'm like, mm, is that an analogy for white supremacy, like synonyms going on here? Okay, so that's, that's one thing that I keep in mind when I do my work, is to not get caught up in the phrasing, but in what it actually means, you know? To, to pay attention to what it means. The second thing is, is that, you know, for, I, I touched on this earlier, but, you know, around my identity is, I am who I am because God said I am who I am. You know, but Baha'u'llah gave a specific station to people of African descent. He called us the pupil of the eye. And he says that we are the black pupil of the eye surrounded by the white, right? And the black people, in this black people, is seeing the reflection of that which is before it. And through it, the light of the spirit shineth forth. And oftentimes, I think people read that, or maybe they've heard that before, and then want to turn around and act like that's not true, or want to be like, yes, but act like it. Read it, understand it, and then act like it. Because it's all about action. Baha'u'llah said, let these not words be your adorning. So act like it. You know, like actually acknowledge, we may know what we're talking about sometimes. Acknowledge that when we say that we are experiencing something in our families, that this happened, don't make an excuse of, oh, well, you know, that person was just being rude. No, they weren't just being rude. They were being racist, you know? I, I think that that's, that's the piece of, of, of this that we have to, and, and, and it is not my place to, to, to point out what someone else is doing in that regard because I have to work on myself, you know? Again, bring thyself to account each day. Faith has known me for a long time. She knows how morbid I am and I've been, you know, listen, I think about death quite frequently, even before I was a breast cancer survivor. She really does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, you know, part of this is, you know, understanding that I am accountable before God for how I raised my children, for what I prayed for to happen, for the what I put into this world. And, and, and I do not want to be, you know, well, well what had happened was, see, you know, <laughs> I don't want to have that conversation. The example of Abdul Baha, you know, I've been to Riverside Church where he spoke. He spoke, as Faith said, I went to Northwestern University. He spoke, I, I took a class deliberately so I could sit in the room where he gave his, his talk there. He spoke coast to coast and he was an old man. Spoke about peace. And this is the, the hundredth, this year is the hundredth anniversary of his passing, you know? Went coast to coast advocating for unity, for peace, for justice, for racial unity, for people to come together. It, if, if he could do it, I, I surely could get myself up every day, even when it's hard and do it. 
Bahia, if I could just add one thing, I know you're trying to bring this to a close, and that is uh, nine years ago when uh, my wife Guy and I we started um, uh, BahaiTeachings.org, we would have never thought um, that we would be able to collaborate and work with you know just amazing people uh, that we have the opportunity to work with. I mean, I today am like just being on this panel. I'm grateful to be a Baha'i because of the fact that I'm able to uh, call people like Masood, Radiance, and Liz, my coworkers in this effort. I mean, how phenomenal, how articulate they are that I wish that the broader world was exposed to their work and who they are. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping that the rest of this country would be able to benefit from this kind of knowledge, this kind of approach, this kind of a fresh approach to dealing with racism in this country. We're so blessed. I believe um, Radiant wrote a story about speaking with a former white supremacist. Maybe that would be a good place to take us out today. Sure, yeah. Um, for those of you who, I wrote a three-part series on Derek Black's uh, story of transformation from being the rising leader of the white nationalist movement to an anti-racist advocate. Um, amazing transformation. He's also the godson of David Duke. Um, so he was fed a lot of hatred his entire life. You know, he, he said, you know, Racism, white, whiteness is our religion. You know, we we only have friends who are white supremacists or babysitters are white supremacists, family, friends, our community, and that you know, and that's how um, much this, how this uh, you know, hate keeps uh, breeding and 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 uh, growing in that population. And when I think, uh, you know, but in in the story, he ended up because he was homeschooled most of his life and, and had a lot of um, racist propaganda and you know indoctrination. So, and he was even like, even once I think when he went to his school, went to, went to a diverse school, like his uh, family quickly pulled him out when they saw the diversity. So they really sheltered him until it was time for him to go to college and on his own and turned out to be a very uh, <laughs> inclusive campus, community with a lot of uh, activism, <laughs> activism and a uh, spirit of so working for social action and justice and it the and the friendships and that community activism really transformed him you know when I when I first uh, read about his story I remember thinking uh, that there there are three things that were really key in his transformation this exposure or, or rather immersion in diversity and and uh, the, these and the truth and these uh, values of, of oneness and and justice this um, education uh, he received his uh, friends uh, educated him about how a lot of the uh, his white nationalist beliefs were were false they gave him a lot of debate kept giving him different data and papers and this and that and there and they explained how you know like uh that it's not just that white nationalists are genetically superior they talk they talked to him about about the, how racism affects is, is woven in all the structures of our society you know they talked to him about redlining environmental racism etc and he also and then the third thing i think is this this friendship this, this sincere, um, you know, our writings say the sincere informal association, this, he had these deep close friendships with people who he would have never have spoken to before that really transformed him. And when I uh, went to see him at the University of Maryland and he, he gave a talk and he also was kind enough to answer more questions with me one-on-one, -on -one, you know, he said that, you know, uh, that if you want to change, you know, minds and hearts, just facts alone will not do it. He said that person needs to be connected to you through some kind of community that makes the two of you relevant. 
and they have to be willing to listen. You can't just put pamphlets under people's windshield wipers and expect to change their world. So it is also, there's this big element of proximity and friendship. He said, like I had, he said, I had heard that racism was a social construct and you know, we were just, you know, and that it was just all propaganda indoctrinated and indoctrination. But he said, I had never heard that before from anybody that I cared about. And when you care about someone, then you have a, a personal responsibility to not put them in harm's way. We are family. Bahia? Yes. I, you know, I, I don't even know how to, how to close this out except for to say that I'm grateful for this opportunity. I love this faith. I think that we are united in that love and that we use that as our guide and we focus on what is being told to us to do the action that first we have to be and know, and then we have to do. Um, and I just am so thankful that you all are doing, knowing, being um, in this space and grateful to be here as a host and spend time with you. Thank you. And Baha'iteachings.org, thank you for, you know, there's never been a platform like this before that I'm aware of. Um, and I still today, I don't think there's any other platform like it that exists. So thank you so much for, you know, being such a contributor to this work and each of you for all that you do. Payam, thank you for creating it and creating the mechanism for us to all receive so much inspiration and knowledge every single day. Like what you're putting out is incredible. And to the three contributing authors of Baha'iteachings.org, I know there are other contributors. Um, Bahia has offered um, an article or two in the past, as have I. So there are many Over other- Over 100. Over 100 by Radiance alone, and Bahia, and you, a lot of people, yes. Wow. So, um, you know, please, this work is about showing up. It's about taking a humble posture of learning. It's about falling down and saying, gosh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. And educate yourself. Don't expect someone who doesn't share your background to be your educator. Like there are all kinds of books and movies and, you know, groups that you can do. Don't, you know, so, um, but that whole thing about having spontaneous, intimate, informal relationships with one another, that is the key. Us being family, we are all the organs of one body. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Bahia, any last word? It's yours. Nope, not at all. Be well. Oh. I would just say this is, you know, today is the one year anniversary of the killing of Brianna Taylor. Mm. And again, you know, I said the names of, of just a, a small portion of the black folks who have died in my lifetime, yeah. you know, in this country. Yeah. And so as we're thinking, you know, don't let this conversation be something that you'd be like, oh, that made me think and it was a nice thing and whatnot. Actually, this afternoon, right after you get done with this, take a piece of paper, write down what are three things that you think that you can do with something in your individual life that you can do, something in the community organizations that you're a part of, something that you can do in your workplace or in the institutions that you are a part of to change this. It takes all of us doing this so that the next Brianna Taylor can actually live out her days mm -hmm. in joy and happiness and dignity.